This is Ubuntu 1804, final release. I have it installed on an external hard drive, but I'm going to show you the installation and the opening sequence in GNOME boxes. First, just a few statistics. This is a long-term support release. It's going to be supported for five years with bug fixes and security updates. The kernel version is 4.15. Not quite the latest one, but close. It's GNOME 3.28.1, and most of the applications are also at 3.28. One exception is Files, which used to be called Nautilus, and it's still at 3.26.3. I believe the reason for this is that version 3.28 no longer supports folders on the desktop, and many people object to this change. Unfortunately, you lose out on some of the new features of 3.28, such as the ability to star files so that you can view a selection of the files you're currently using without hunting through the entire file structure. It comes with version 6.0.3.2 of LibreOffice, close to the latest version, although it doesn't have all of the components. It has the major ones and it comes with Firefox Quantum 59.0.2, also close to the latest version. Now here's a chart showing the relative RAM used by the various Ubuntu distros, and you'll see that Ubuntu with GNOME is by far the heaviest in resource use. It uses 983 megabytes of RAM with just the desktop open, 1,212 megabytes with the Google search page open, but no search underway, and 1,337 megabytes with an HD video playing on YouTube. This is going to vary from machine to machine and from instance to instance, but it gives you an idea of the relative use of the various Ubuntu desktops. Now I'm going to start the installation on GNOME boxes. Normally I would try Ubuntu first and connect to the internet, but since this is a virtual machine and I'm already connected, I'm going to go directly to the installation. It has selected English language, so I'm going to continue. Keyboard layout is English US. Now I'm going to select the normal installation. There is an option for a minimal installation. It actually installs all of the software and then it deletes some of the software so it takes longer to install than the normal installation. And normally I would download updates while installing Ubuntu but I'm not going to do it now and I am not going to install the third-party software because I have this already installed on a remote hard drive and as soon as the installation is finished I'll switch to that. I could just erase the disk and install Ubuntu since it's a virtual disk, but I'm still going to click on something else and continue. And of course, all it shows is the virtual disk. I'm going to keep that as the location for the bootloader and install a new partition table. Continue. Now I'm going to add a partition. It'll be the full size since I don't need a swap partition. From the beginning of this space to the end and use as ext4 journaling file system. The mount point is forward slash root. 
OK. Now I'm going to click on Install Now. And it's going to format this one partition, number one, on Virtual Disk SDA as EXT4. Continue. It identifies my location. I'm going to enter my name. Password. I'm going to continue to require my password to log in. Now while it's installing, I'll pause the video so this doesn't take an enormously long time. Now the installation is complete, you need to restart the computer. I'm going to restart now. Remove the installation medium and then press enter. All right, this is the sign in screen. If you have a choice of Ubuntu, which is on Xorg, although they don't say it, or Ubuntu on Wayland, but Xorg is the default display manager. So I'm going to enter my password. And click on sign in. So this is the way it looks when it first boots up. You get this welcome screen, which is new in GNOME for Ubuntu. And if you're familiar with the Unity desktop, you may not be familiar with the GNOME desktop. This explains what it is. Click on Next. This Live Patch is a new option. Canonical Live Patch helps keep your computer secure by applying some updates that would normally require restarting. Would you like to set up Live Patch now? It doesn't give you an option. You either set it up or do nothing. I'm not going to set it up because I like the update policy of Ubuntu the way it has been. It asks you when it's about to do something. It asks you whether you want to do it or not. I always say yes. I never prevent it from updating, but I don't like it to do it automatically, so I'm going to skip this. Now would I like to report information that helps developers improve it? This includes things like the computer model, what software is installed, and the appropriate location you choose, which happens to be America, Chicago. Then it gives you the option of showing the first report. And it shows you what this is. I actually have no problem with this. However, since this is an installation of a virtual machine, this will mean nothing to them. So I'm going to click on No, Don't Send System Information. And then click on Next. Now uh, this is also something new with Ubuntu, with GNOME. You can use software to install apps like these. And actually, if you click on one of these, it 
it opens software. However, I'm going to skip installing it for now. So now I'm done, but before I say done, let me say that once you are finished with this welcome screen, you're going to have a very difficult time, if not impossible time, getting it back. Unlike Ubuntu Mate, where the welcome screen is still available in the menu, I was unable to find it anywhere. That's why I'm showing this in a virtual machine. Once I had finished with it, it was gone. Now this operates essentially just like any other GNOME. You can click on activities or you can press the Windows key or Super key to get to the overview. The only thing is you notice that the dash is permanent. You don't have to wait for activities to open to see the dash and therefore they call it a dock. And if you click on this array down here, it shows the installed applications. I'm not going to go through all of them. It has some of the LibreOffice suite, but not all of it. It has some games, rhythm box. I'll go through settings later on the actual installation. So now I'm going to quit this and go to the installation on my external hard drive. This is how the dock looked initially. It had Firefox web browser, Thunderbird mail, files, which is Nautilus, Rhythmbox, music player and organizer, LibreOffice Writer, Ubuntu Software, which is GNOME Software, Help, the Amazon Store, and it shows Simple Screen Recorder, which I installed because that's currently running. So this is how it looks now. I'm running this from one of six partitions on my external hard drive, and all six volumes are showing up here on the desktop, along with the trash. I want to get rid of these, but the only way I could find was with the Tweak tool, which wasn't installed by default. However, I downloaded it. I'm pressing the Super key or Windows key, and typing TW, and there I get tweaks. Now I'm going to add this to the dock also. Add to favorites. And I'm also going to run it. Now under appearance, animations was turned on originally. That just uses up resources, so I turned it off. Under desktop, it says icons uh, on desktop, and it's turned on by default. I'm going to turn it off. All you have to do is click anywhere in this little window. Whether you click on on or on the blank space, doesn't matter. It's going to turn it off. It simply toggles whatever is there. And now you see the icons are gone. The tweak tool is down here, but it's kind of disappearing. I'm going to go over to Settings. Click here anywhere. And over to the Settings symbol. It opens the last settings I adjusted. I'm going to go down here to Dock. And I'm going to adjust the icon size. It's 48. I'm going to make it 32, which is large enough for me. And that gives me a little more room to add more items to the dock without having them disappear and without having to scroll down.
By right clicking on the desktop I can change the background. These are almost all new, so I'll go through these and I'll edit this so all you see is each individual background. As you can see, the top panel and the background of the dock change colors to coordinate with whatever background you have. Now this looks familiar, but uh, the first instance of this had a note that it changes color throughout the day, and this instance does not. I think that's the difference. Here we are at the beginning. As you can see, there are a lot of backgrounds and they're all new, so this is quite an improvement. Some of the old ones were getting rather stale. I've done some previous videos on the subject of GNOME 3.28 and on the subject of the bug in Ubuntu 17.10 and now in Ubuntu 18.04 that prevents the easy installation of some Epson and Brother scanners. So to see those, just go to my channel, click on Videos, and under Ubuntu 18.04, Scanner Problems, How to Fix Them, you'll see how to fix the scanner problems that still persist in the final release, unfortunately. And under GNOME 3.28 in Debian testing, some new features, you'll find a description of GNOME 3.28 that covers a lot of the features that are also available in the Ubuntu version. There are, of course, some differences. Let's take a closer look at the tweaks. Some of these are available in other versions of GNOME, but the number that are available in the Ubuntu version is somewhat limited. I already turned animations off, as I said. Uh, you can get some new themes, but I'm not going to go into that now. They have a few more installed than they used to. The overview shortcut is set for the left super key. That's like clicking on activities, but you click on the left super key instead, and it gets you directly to the overview. On the top bar, the applications menu they say is on here is simply this one. For instance, under tweaks, it gives you some options. This is not the general applications menu. I'm going to include the date and the clock. Under Windows, the Maximize, Minimize buttons are already enabled in Ubuntu, which is unlike GNOME and Fedora, for instance, and they're on the right side this time. If you want to move them to the left, you can click on left. Now, this Attach Modal Dialogs, 
turn to on. That means when you open a dialog box, it sits in the middle and you can't move it. If you turn it to off, you'll be able to move your dialog boxes out of the way. So I'm going to turn that off. Under workspaces, I'm going to leave dynamic workspaces. For instance, here's the Windows key. I'm moving to this workspace, and I'm going to open files in this workspace. So now when I press on the Windows key, I have an additional workspace down here. Those are dynamic workspaces. But if, for instance, I wanted to have four workspaces all the time regardless, I could enable static workspaces and I could set the number to any number I wanted within reason. And here I'm showing workspaces on a primary display only. I only have a primary display, so that doesn't mean much. Now going back to settings, by the way, you can get this from the overview also. Airplane mode is off for Wi-Fi, and that's because I'm not in an airplane and I don't have to disable Wi-Fi. Bluetooth is on. I really don't need it, so I'm going to turn it off because I don't have any Bluetooth devices, and it just uses resources. The background takes me back to what I had before for setting the backgrounds. The dock I've gone into a little bit, I changed the size down to 32 pixels. I can also change the location to bottom. Or right. But I'm going to leave it on left. Notifications. I've enabled notification pop-ups. I've enabled lock screen notifications. Now this covers the things that are included in notifications. And I'm not going to go through all of this, but you can turn some of these off if you wish. Under search here, this includes some of the things that are searched, and you can turn that on and off. You can reset your region or language. This is, these are the options for universal access. There's a screen reader, sound keys, visual alerts, an on-screen keyboard. Now you can access some of your online accounts from the desktop if you wish, but I don't really want to do that. Now under privacy here, you may have encountered some of this in the welcome screen, specifically problem reporting. It's shown as automatic. This sends reports of technical problems and helps us improve Ubuntu. Reports are sent anonymously and are scrubbed of personal data. So you can leave this on if you wish or turn it off if you're worried that they're invading your privacy. Now, I've turned off collecting my usage and history because I do consider that an invasion of privacy. Location services is off, but I could turn it on, in which case, when I look at a particular store, for instance, in Google, it will find a store in my neighborhood. I'll leave it off for now. The screen lock I turned off, I, I, I just hate having the screen turn off when I'm in the middle of something. It's just annoying. Sharing, I don't want to share anything. Sound, of course, I've already been setting that so I could make the 
sound recording for this video and power as you can see there's a lot more here under power than there was under the tweak tool in power and I've turned off dimming the screen when inactive I've set blank screen to never now here it says turn off Wi-Fi to save power that's on I'm going to turn it off I don't want to turn off my Wi-Fi to save power again when I'm right in the middle of doing something that requires Wi-Fi it's going to turn off and I don't want that I already turned off Bluetooth because I don't have any Bluetooth devices now under suspend and power button I don't have a suspend button I only have a power button and I've turned off automatic suspend and when the power button is pressed unfortunately GNOME 3 has a very limited range of options you have power off suspend or nothing so I'm going to keep it on power off some other desktops have an option to ask you first before it does anything so when you press the power button it will say do you really want to shut down or something of that order not GNOME 3 under network my wired connection is unplugged I don't have a VPN virtual private network and I don't have a network proxy under devices there are lots of options the display is in landscape mode etc the keyboard gives you keyboard shortcuts which you could change if you want them I frankly use too many different desktops and too many different applications to remember keyboard shortcuts so I don't use very many of them now here under mouse and touchpad again there's a lot more information here than there was under the tweak tool I have the touchpad on of course I turn natural scrolling off that moves the content not the view I'll, I'd rather move the view touchpad speed I didn't change tap to click I turned off I have a left and right button I don't need to tap to click two finger scrolling I turned off but edge scrolling I turned on now under printers I haven't added any printers yet under removable media it asks me what to do when I insert a CD or DVD music player a little photo SD card or various types of software I don't have a Wacom tablet and I usually leave the color alone so those are the settings Uh, it appears when I was fiddling with the settings that I accidentally turned my Wi-Fi off and the airplane mode on. I certainly didn't intend to do that. Turn off the airplane mode. And turn on the Wi-Fi. Now I'm going to take a look at Ubuntu software. I see they have VLC. Let me try to install that and see what happens. Enter my password. authenticate yes. 
It doesn't give you any details, but it gives you a little timeline. I'm going to pause the video. And now it's ready to go. I'm not going to launch it from here, however. I'm going to press the super key and type B and I get the media player. I think it's taking a while to launch because I'm using simple screen recorder and that's using a lot of the resources. There it goes. Allow metadata network access? No. Continue. And there's the VLC media player. It just launches very slowly when Simple Screen Recorder is on. No, I don't want to do that. Of course, there's also a system monitor. Resources. It's using about 40 to 60 percent of my CPU capacity. It's using 1.7 gigabytes of 3.7 available, but zero swap. It does have two gigabytes of swap, but they're in a swap file, not a swap partition. So it's not a lightweight, but it doesn't pretend to be a lightweight. So would I use this? No, I'm afraid it's too resource hungry for my little cheap laptop. If I had a bigger and faster CPU and more random access memory, I might use it. But I'd rather use something that's more suitable for my equipment. However, if you do have a modern, fast, well-equipped computer, you might enjoy this. This is XRAM Tech. Thanks for watching.